The Toronto Raptors have the wonderful distinction of being the team no one wants to play in the first round, trademark, copyright, etc. And one of the Boston Celtics, Milwaukee Bucks, and Philadelphia 76ers will have to play, said Toronto Raptors in the first round. Should those teams be afraid of the Raptors in a potential upset? We get the goods from the hosts of Locked On Celtics, Locked On Bucks, and Locked On Sixers to hear why they might be afraid, what the problems the Raptors pose are. We're going to dig into all that on today's episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for being here. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1154 of Locked On Raptors for Thursday, April the 7th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter as always, at WoodleySean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors. And you can support the podcast by following, subscribing, rating, reviewing on your favorite podcast apps for the low, low price of on the house you can also go to youtube and join the over 1800 satisfied folks who have signed up over there subscribed over there there's no sign up you just hit the red button and you're all set and you get those locked on raptors episodes you can get notifications so you never miss an episode when it goes live please go support the show the playoffs are coming up we're going to be here every day throughout you're going to want to be there watching the videos of me why wouldn't you want to see my face every day uh it's not just my face you're going to see today though here on your first listen of the day, we've got check ins from all the hosts of Locked On Bucks, Locked On Celtics, and Locked On Sixers. The Raptors are going to be playing one of those teams in the first round. It seems the Heat seem to have the top seed on lock. And those three teams are very, very closely clustered between two and four. We don't know where the Raptors are going to finish, although fifth seems pretty possible, maybe likely, after the Celtics beat the Bulls last night. Either way, on today's show, we are going to hear from Keith Pompey and Devon Gibbons from Locked On Sixers, uh, Kane Pittman from Locked On Bucks, and John Corrales from Locked On Celtics to get their reasoning for why the Raptors might pose problems for those teams in the first round, even if all those teams will be favored. Uh, we're going to start with the Sixers because that's who the Raptors are playing tonight, of course. Uh, and there's some interesting stuff at play. Matisse Thibel has been ruled ineligible to play in the game tonight. That seems to suggest some sort of vaccine chicanery that he's not vaccinated. Tim Bontemps from ESPN has, has, of course, been reporting on this quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the Celtics and the Sixers are believed to probably have some unvaccinated guys who won't be able to play in the Toronto games in a potential postseason series. It's not been confirmed or anything like that, but those two teams uh, refuse to acknowledge whether they were fully vaccinated or not, whereas like the Heat and the Bucks were happy to say, yeah, we're all vaxxed up and good to go. So uh, that poses some problems. And Matisse Thibel in particular is a very important player for this Sixers team. Do I kind of think his defensive impact is a little bit overhyped? Yes, you know, he doesn't really play enough minutes for me to, and he doesn't justify being on the floor with his offense enough for me to really think he's in that sort of top tier of all world defenders. But of course, he's very good and he's probably their best wing defense option. And against the Raptors, that's a pretty valuable thing to have. So we're going to check in now with Keith Pompey and Devon Gibbons from Locked On Sixers. They're going to give us the goods on why the Raptors might pose a problem and also why maybe the Sixers shouldn't be so worried. They do, after all, have. Joel Embiid. We'll check out the video. I'll come back to the other side with my thoughts. But first up, let's get to Keith Pompey and Devon Gibbons from Locked On Sixers to fill you in on why they might be worried about a Raptors first round matchup. And as well, a bit of a preview of tonight's game. Hey, welcome to Locked On 76ers. That's Keith Pompey. I'm Devon Gibbons jumping on here with the uh, our friends from Locked On 76ers with Sean. And uh, we want to make sure we give our thoughts on the game tonight. Raptors and Sixers. So, Keith, I want you to start off with uh, some of the problems that the Raptors do pose for the 76ers. Well, I think the biggest problem is that the Sixers won't have Matisse Thibel. I mean, that's the biggest problem. When you look at the Raptors, and you see how interchangeable they are. They got a lot of guys like 6'8 to 6'10 range who can play multiple positions. You know, uh, you look at a guy like uh, Fred Van v, uh, you look at a guy like Pascal Siakam, those two types of players. And, and, and you look at uh, uh, Gary Trent Jr. I mean, these are dudes who can go out there and get buckets. And when you don't have a Matisse Thibel out there, that's really going to impact you. You know what I mean? They devise a great plan to defend Joel Embiid. But at the same time, when you don't have your best perimeter defender and then you got to mismatch certain stuff, 
And then you got to depend on James Harden and Tyrese Maxey and uh, and uh, Tobias Harris to get stops. That's how you get, like, lost in the game, so to speak. That's how stuff starts falling apart for you. So, to me, not having Matisse Thiable there is going to be a huge, I mean, huge uphill battle for the Sixers. Yeah, and, and that, of course, Keith, is for tonight's game against the Raptors. Now, I'll even look at it for the it, looking further down the line in the event that these two teams do face off in the postseason. I'll look at it on the other side and say that it, it, all season long, if we've, as we've watched this team, Keith, it's been about Joel Embiid. And while Kim Birch and the defense that they have with Siakam and Boucher coming in, OG Ananobi, all NBA-level defender, all of that, it's not an easy task to slow down Joel Embiid. So if the Sixers are having a really good night from the supporting cast, whether it's James Harden is much better than the supporting cast, but Tyrese Maxey, as you mentioned, Thibel, if he's available, and, of course, Tobias Harris, I look at this where it's going to be tough for four mm -hmm. games to beat the Sixers and not having Joel Embiid go off. And the way that he has played all season at this MVP level, certainly important tonight, but most definitely important in a seven game series where he can get their players in foul troubles. He can foul trouble. He can pose those issues for them where Nick nurse and the coaching staff are going to have to devise some different things of how to beat the Sixers. Because if they send those double teams and the Sixers are scoring around the, the around the arc and everybody's coming in and driving to the basket and getting some buckets and the free throws that all the coaches are now complaining about with Harden and B getting to the foul line, that could be a problem for the Toronto Raptors with their interchangeable players, and they do have depth. But when Embiid gets going, the number one thing all season, which helps them win every time out, is how good he is, how great he is. So that would be a problem that I think could pose not only tonight, but most certainly for the Toronto, Toronto Raptors, Raptors in any seven-game seven series. Games. Tough, Tough championship, championship pedigree, pedigree, but it's a big task. So that's Devon Gibbons and Keith Pompey from Locked On Sixers. Big thanks to them for chipping in their thoughts. And look, I agree. Joel Embiid is amazing and will be difficult to overcome four times out of seven in a series. That said, the Raptors have a pedigree of giving him a whole lot of problems. We've talked about it a little bit on the show here. Just to pull some numbers from his career splits per basketball reference. Joel Embiid against the Raptors has the lowest true shooting percentage against any Eastern Conference team in his career, a 55.3 true shooting. The only teams that have held him to a lower true shooting over the course of his entire career are from the Western Conference, Utah, Golden State, Memphis, and Denver. And, you know, those are all much smaller samples, half the sample that the Raptors have against Embiid over the course of his career. It is... You know, it's a recurring theme here, and it's not just, well, they had Marcus Gasol for a couple years there, and he was the reason why they slowed him down. Yes, he was a big reason for that. Of course, remember the zero-point game back in 2019-20, one of the highlights of that wonderful season. But even last year, when the Raptors had no center depth whatsoever, and even this season in the one game where they were really whole against the Sixers, or at least close to whole, they've given Embiid a ton of of trouble last season of course you know the Raptors had a couple of really scintillating wins over the Sixers gave Joel Embiid a lot of trouble he had a 52 true shooting percentage last year against the Raptors this year it's 60 but he's only played two games against the team the Raptors uh didn't they didn't come up against him in the first time they played the Sixers this year he was out in the second game they played it was that December 28th game where the Raptors did not have Fred Van Vliet they had no OG no Scotty Barnes because of COVID no Precious Achua they started a lineup of Siakam Boucher Yuta Watanabe Gary uh, Gary Trent Jr. and Malachi Flynn with DJ Wilson Daniel Oturu Tremont Waters and Svi Mihailuk coming off the bench like that was not a team equipped to go up against Joel Embiid when they had a more full complement of guys and a more refined Precious Achua in particular in the last game against the Sixers, where they won 93-88, Embiid goes for 6 of 20 from the field, 0 of 3 from deep. He got to the line 11 times. He had 21 and 13, but they gave him a ton of trouble. And that is, I think, the recipe here for the Raptors, is they have the length and the size and the diversity of looks they can throw at Embiid to really give him trouble. I, I mean, Precious did a pretty damn good job in single coverage against Embiid, that's not probably something that can sustain over the course of a full series, but I certainly think, it, you know, they have the kookiness and the funk to throw Embiid off for a couple of games here. 
and you know, again, you could have Embiid have wonky, bad shooting nights, and he's still a positive on the floor. Think back to the 2018-19 playoffs, where in the second round, Embiid was like a plus a thousand in his minutes, and they lost it because of the backup center situation. I do think the backup center situation might even be worse for the Sixers right now, with DeAndre Jordan and like Paul Reed kind of getting those minutes as the backup five. Charles Bassey is like one of their go-to options or one of their better options that they have on hand. That could be a serious point of, of issue for the Sixers as well. And obviously, the Thibel thing really comes into play here. If Thibel's not available for a series, at least the home games in a series against the Raptors, like the Raptors will be able to do their thing, which is find mismatches to hunt and really take advantage of over the course of a whole series. You know, instead of Matisse Thibel getting the assignment of Pascal Siakam or, you know, for Fred, Fred Van Vliet, who I would probably stick Thibel on if I'm the Sixers to try to cut off that head of the Raptors offense, you know, there's going to be Tobias Harris out there, Tyrese Maxey, who is a feisty defender, but is undersized against the size the Raptors present. Uh, you bring in Georges Niang. He's not a good defender by any means. It, it just gets really tricky here for the Sixers, I think, without Thibel, because their whole defense against the Raptors in particular just takes a big hit without him. Yes, Embiid's going to be there for like help side blocks at the rim and stuff like that. He's always going to be lurking. He's always going to be a deterrent. But without Thibel, that becomes, I think, closer to like a 50-50 series, honestly, just based on the way the Sixers defense doesn't have a ton of juice after you take Thibel and his playmaking out. It really is Embiid and a bunch of guys who he's going to have to clean up for. Think of like the Utah Jazz, for example. I think it could be kind of a similar situation that we see there where their defense has struggled despite having Rudy freaking Gobert at the back line of their defense. If the wing defense is not there, it's going to expose a lot of problems. The Raptors are going to get penetration. They're going to get wide open threes, and that could be a, a pretty big hindrance to the Sixers' chances of moving on. So uh, we will, of course, see more from this matchup tonight. We'll dig into it on tomorrow's episode, but big thanks again to Keith and Devon for checking in there. On the other side, we're going to dig into the Milwaukee Bucks, who are the team I think I probably have the healthiest respect for. How could you not after what Giannis did last year, the postseason, and what he's doing this year? We will examine the Bucks and hear from Kane Pittman from Lockdown Bucks about why the Raptors might give the Bucks some pause in a first round series. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online, who are the place to go for all of your sports wagering needs and info it's the master's championship this weekend there's still a, i guess the tee off has already started but you can do live betting that's no problem if you feel like tiger woods is making a surge go put some money on him if he's looking good in the first round i can't believe tiger is playing golf again it's unbelievable um but either way the the masters you've got of course the nba playoffs coming up too lots of opportunity for daily betting uh, you know your futures betting for the postseason as well it's all there for you and bet online has all the sports wagering information you might need they have podcasts and reviews of all the different leagues this season to help make you the informed wagerer before you put your money down on your team of choice head to the website today use your mobile device and learn more about the trends and the action at bet online where the game starts all right we continue on your first listen of the day here on locked on raptors and now we are going to talk a little bit about the milwaukee bucks the bucks are terrifying frankly with Giannis Antetokounmpo at the head of the snake he's a really really damn good basketball player and the Raptors are going to be in tough to contend with the many, many problems he presents. Brooke Lopez is back. Their defense is looking a little bit more stout now as well. And Drew Holiday is a wonderful point of attack defender. Feels like the kind of guy that might be able to take Fred Van Vliet out of a series. And it feels like a lot of the burden will fall to Pascal Siakam, who has happened to be fantastic against the Bucs this, this season. Of course, the Raptors have only taken on Giannis one time out of the three times they've played the Bucs, but they're dominance of Milwaukee goes back to last year year before that it's been a long run here of the Raptors kind of having the Bucks number going all the way back to the postseason in 2019 so let's check in now with Kane Pittman for his biggest reason why the Raptors might pose some problems as well as his thoughts on why the Bucks maybe shouldn't be too too worried and why they might be able to survive a first round series with the Raptors here is Kane what's up guys it's Kane Pittman here from Locked On Bucks and uh, wouldn't it be fitting if the Bucks and the Raptors play each other in another postseason series? Uh, these teams know each other pretty well. Uh, certainly the teams have changed from that first, first round series that they had uh, back in the Jason Kidd era when Giannis was very young. DeMar DeRozan was still a Toronto Raptor. But nonetheless, these two teams do have history, of course, the Eastern Conference Finals in 2019. But if you're the Bucks, why would you be worried about the Raptors? 
because they're really weird, because they're perhaps uh, the most versatile team in the entire league. I'm curious with Toronto to see how this, the style that they play, the size and the length that they have, how that plays out across the course of a seven game series. I think they're in the perfect situation to just beat teams during the regular season because they're so different to everyone else. So how does that play out across a seven game series? I think that would be really fascinating. I think what the Raptors do have in their favor is Nick Nurse, who we know uh, probably has endless tricks in his bag to throw at the Bucs defensively. The big question I would have, and the Raptors have won all three games against the Bucs so far this season, Giannis only played in one of those. So the question that I have is, do are the Raptors big enough to slow down Giannis across seven games? If you think back to the Eastern Conference Finals when the Raptors beat the Bucs, of course, Kawhi Leonard gets a lot of credit for the defensive job that he did. Uh, But you guys know, I know, that it wasn't just Kawhi Leonard. It was Serge Ibaka. It was Marc Gasol. It was also Pascal Siakam. It was multiple bodies swarming at the Bucs, and they weren't able to hit a three. I would suspect that even though the size might not necessarily be there, they would try the same. Are the Bucs going to brick every single three out there? We'll see what happens if this series potentially plays out. So I I just think the, the tricks that the Raptors have make them an interesting matchup. The size that they have makes them an interesting matchup. But ultimately, I think that the Bucs with Drew Holiday, who wasn't there last time these two teams played in the playoffs to potentially play on Fred Van Vliet, I think the Bucs would be in a, in a decent position. But this could be a competitive series. And I think the challenge with the Toronto Raptors is that they may take you a while to figure out how to play against this Toronto team. Last year, we saw the Bucs off to slow starts during the playoff series. Basically, Every series, just scraped by Miami, lost game one to Brooklyn, lost game one to Atlanta, lost game one to the Phoenix Suns. And I just think against this Toronto team, the last thing you want to do is to get off to a slow start because once they sink their teeth into a series, you could find yourself going six or potentially going seven games as well. So uh, I, I don't think if the Bucks had their choice of opponents between the Bulls and the Raptors in the first round. I don't think that they would be choosing the Raptors just because of the challenges they may present. So uh, they've been one of the more entertaining teams to watch this season. There's no doubt about that. I'm fascinated to see how this plays out over the last couple of days. But I think the Bucks and the Raptors, if they meet in the, in the playoffs, it might be a long series. And that's our pal Kane Pittman from Locked on Bucks. And, and yeah, I, I think, look, the Bucks would be heavy favorites in that series against the Raptors. Probably if you were lining up Raptors, Bucks, Raptors, Celtics, Raptors, Sixers, and look with what the Vegas odds would be on all those three series. The Raptors odds of beating the Bucks would be the longest when you factor in the Bob Williams injury for the Celtics. But I do think the idea of just the number of different bodies the Raptors can throw at Giannis is interesting. Um, you know, I, I think it, it can't be understated how important Marc Gasol was to guarding him in the past, and they don't have a Marc Gasol on their team right now. But I do think the emergence of Precious Achua, who has just been so damn good defensively, is at times the best defender on the Raptors, even if maybe there's some gaps here and there. Is he still learning the, the scheme and everything like that? He's a young dude. He's 22. It happens. But I, I do think he has the upside of being the best defender on the Raptors. OG has been always a pretty viable option to throw onto Giannis as well. And if you're trying to build the wall, which has been the way to defend Giannis over the last, you know, I don't know, half decade, the Raptors have pretty good stable of guys considering some of their pet lineups are just inherently wall-like where with all the arms and length they've got going on. You know, obviously the three-point shooting is, I think, probably the swing factor in that type of series. And honestly, it might be the swing factor for the Raptors in any series. We've seen the what they look like when you know Pascal Siakam is breaking down a defense but nobody's hitting threes it can get pretty stodgy pretty quick and frankly I think Precious Achua is sort of the swing factor not only in a buck series but kind of in all of these series like if we're seeing a Precious Achua who's hitting a couple threes a game in addition to offering the defense he, he provides like that becomes a huge swing piece for the Raptors he's not going to establish any floor for the Raptors or anything like that that's Pascal that's Fred that's OG that's Scotty But I think in terms of ceiling, like if you get a big precious series, that could be the difference between upsetting one of these teams and not. And I think against the Bucs, that might be the series in which he's the most important because he might be the primary guy to throw on Giannis. You don't want to have Siakam racking up fouls trying to be the primary. And I think Siakam's maybe a little bit slight to deal with Giannis every single time down the floor. That's just not something you want. 
OG, I think, would be a, another guy you can throw in there for sure. But he also might be someone you have to throw on to Chris Middleton if he gets cooking. Or if Drew Holiday gets cooking, that's been the sort of way they've deployed OG as a guy to toss on a guard who is lighting the Raptors up. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's not an easy matchup by any means. And Giannis is clearly the best player in the series. I think he's the best player in the Eastern Conference right now and beat a close second. Um, it's a, it's not insurmountable, probably. Like any series, I guess, is winnable if you can junk it up enough. But it would be, I think, probably the one the Raptors are least likely to win. But as Kane pointed out, I don't think the Bucks are thrilled about the idea of playing the Raptors in round one. And it's not just about potentially losing a first round series. It's about potentially going long in the first round, being completely tuckered out for what will be an enormous second round series against probably the Celtics or the Sixers uh, in that 2-3 bracket. Like, I don't think I would want to play seven hard-fought games against this weird-ass Raptors team that is totally different in terms of scheming and game planning uh, than those other teams are. And then going into that second round completely gassed and having to go up against a team that maybe just whacks the Bulls in the first round or the Cavs in the in the play-in or whatever it is, I guess it wouldn't be the Bulls, probably. I, it's hard to say. The, the bracket's all hurting my brain. It's all so clustered right now. But yeah, if they take on the Bulls, that's probably an easier series to get through. If they take on the Cavs, it's an easier series to get through. And uh, taking on the Raptors doesn't sound like a ton of fun. And obviously, it'd be the Heat, I guess, in the second round. Now that I'm thinking about how the bracket works, uh, <laughs> it might actually be the Heat that that team's playing. And I don't want to go into a series against the Heat in a 1-4 either. That sounds like a nightmare as well. Um, so great stuff from from Kane. Thanks for sending that over, our good Australian buddy over there. On the other side, we're going to check in with John Corrales from Locked On Celtics, a regular appearer on this podcast, and we will get his read on the Raptors from the Celtics side of things. But before we do that, just a reminder that you can check out Locked On NBA every single day. It is our daily recap of all the night's action in the NBA with a different set of hosts each day, Monday through Friday. You get uh, a great, great look at, a, at the whole swath of the league. And with so many games going on, it's hard to keep up with everything going on. The NBA guys over there on Locked NBA are, are doing a great job of filling you in if you are missing some games night to night. And uh, you can go subscribe to that show wherever it is you get your podcast and on YouTube as well. All right, let's finish up here. Your first listen of the day with uh, Celtics talk. John Corrales from Lockdown Celtics is here. He's queued up. We're going to fire away, and he's going to tell us why the Raptors might be a problematic matchup for those Boston Celtics who have been very, very good, the best team in the NBA by a lot of metrics over the back part of the season, at least on par with the Suns at the very least. And uh, honestly, if I'm picking a finals right now, I'm torn between Bucks and Celtics making it all the way. Like, they're both really freaking good teams. I think that they would both be favorites against the Raptors. But as has been the theme throughout, don't know if the Celtics would be all that thrilled about playing the Raptors in round one either. So let's get to it with John Corrales breaking down uh, why the Raptors might be that team the Celtics are fearful of in the first round of the playoffs. Here it is. Here it is. Take it away, John. My buddy, my friend, my pal, Sean Woodley said, John, Will you let us know why the Celtics might not want to play the Toronto Raptors in the playoffs? I said, sure, I'll let you know. I'll let all you guys know. It's because you guys are annoying. The Toronto Raptors are a really annoying basketball team because you're not supposed to be good still. You're not supposed to be a fifth seed in the Eastern Conference playoffs still. Why won't you guys just go away? But no, you have to hang around. You have to have Fred Van Vliet hit every damn clutch shot in the world. You have to have Pascal Siakam kind of rejuvenated and be this awesome two-way player again, where at the beginning of the season, it seemed like he was struggling a little bit. No, you, you still have to keep all that going. Oh, and you have that big, bad season in Tampa Bay, and then you get Scotty Barnes because of it? All right, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. You guys deserved a good player for all that crap, but it still doesn't annoy me any less. And here's the worst part about playing the Raptors. The worst part about playing the Raptors is you just do whatever it takes to win. You'll do anything to muck up the game. You will play a two, three zone, a box on one, a parallelogram on four, whatever the hell Nick nurse decides to come up with the Toronto Raptors. Just do it. They do it willingly. They do it with vigor and energy. And it's just, annoying i don't like watching it because it's hard to beat and i want the celtics to have an easy first round series give us the bulls hell 
I, in a way, would rather have a series against the Brooklyn Nets because at least I know what the Brooklyn Nets are. I know you've got to do something to limit Kevin Durant. I know you got to do something to limit Kyrie Irving, but I also know there are holes there you can attack. And I also know that the Nets aren't going to be able to adjust quite as well. The Raptors just keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. And we're trying to have a boxing match and you guys are throwing mud in eyes and hitting people with two by fours and whatever it is, salt in the eyes, Mr. Fuji style, whatever it is that you guys got to do, you do it. So it's annoying from a Celtics perspective, because even though I think the Celtics could beat the Toronto Raptors in a seven game series, it'll probably go seven and it'll probably come down to the last five minutes of the game. And it'll probably be a series where you look back on it and say, man, that took a lot out of this team. And I just don't want that. That is our pal, John Corrales, the only acceptable Boston Celtics fan in the world. And yeah, I think I echo his sentiments here. I, I would probably take the Celtics to beat the Raptors, even without Robert Williams available, but it would not be a picnic for Boston because of the way the Raptors tend to defend the Celtics pretty successfully. I mean, think back to the quotes from Jason Tatum about the Raptors being the team that troubles him the most. And I think in a postseason series where the Celtics are so dependent on Jason Tatum, right? Like him and Brown both carry like 30% usage. If the Raptors are able to do their star limiting thing and harass Jason Tatum and force him to give up the ball quite a bit, I mean, Tatum's a much improved passer. So there's probably, you know, some element of the Celtics being like, all right, dare us to pass with Jason Tatum, but that'll work out for you well, I'm sure. But like, if you are going to force Marcus Smart to hit threes and you're going to force Grant Williams or Daniel Tice to hit threes and Al Horford and all these guys, Derek White, who's not been a good three-point shooter at all really throughout his whole career. I think there is a formula there to just muck things enough, uh, muck things up enough for Tatum and Brown to make it into a total rock fight of a series. I think this series would average about 85 points a game on either side uh, because I think the Raptors would have a lot of trouble scoring against the Celtics half-court defense as well. And they're a really disciplined transition defense, too, because Marcus March is dictating all the orders at all times. He's an incredible, incredible defensive quarterback. But I do think there's a pathway here for the Raptors that opens up a little bit more than it would have if Robert Williams were available. Uh, Robert Williams is such a good switch defender. He's so good at the rim. He just kind of stifles a lot of what you want to do in the half court and makes what they do on defense in Boston pretty impenetrable. But if you swap in a Grant Williams, a Daniel Tice, an Al Horford playing the five with a smaller look around them, I think the Raptors potentially have the size and the mismatch hunting to at least pick at that one scab, that one wound, and force you know extra help to come. And then from there, you get Pascal in his playmaking mode, and you get Fred Van Vliet getting catch-and-shoot threes, and Gary Trent Jr. getting catch-and-shoot threes, and OG Ananobi getting catch-and-shoot threes, and Precious Achua getting catch-and-shoot threes. And I think that could be sort of the swing. Again, three-point shooting is going to be so uh, so much of a dictator of the Raptors' success in the postseason. And if they're not getting guys knocking those down when the opportunities come, it's going to be all she wrote because they can't really manufacture offense other ways in the half court right now, um, especially against teams with great rim protection. It's just going to be difficult to get guys like uh, you know Fred Van Vliet to the rim. Get your, Gary Trent's not offering a lot of rim pressure. You have a chance, I think, with Siakam and Barnes and OG. But... Not having Robert Williams makes that mismatch hunting, hunting a little bit easier. It makes them a little thinner. There's fewer guys they can throw out there who are surefire great defenders. And so I think that would be the avenue here for the Raptors is just to make it super ugly and pick at one or two wounds within the, the Celtics defense. Stay the hell away from Marcus Smart. Stay the hell away from Jason Tatum, who are both incredible defenders. But there might be some avenues to isolation buckets and collapsing the defense and getting kickouts that just weren't there when Robert Williams was there making this like completely monstrous defense, a real bear to ha to handle and tackle. So I agree with John. I don't think the Raptors are beating the Celtics in a series, but I do think there's some potential there to make it nasty and gross. And again, leave the Celtics in a second round series against the heat in a one four feeling pretty uneasy about their chances of having the gas to weather that kind of series against another nasty team in the Miami heat. 
Uh, with that, I'm going to leave it there for now uh, and uh, send you off into tonight's game against the Philadelphia 76ers. Should be a good one. And also, in terms of like standings implications and postseason matchups, there's a pretty good chance that if the Raptors beat the Sixers tonight, that Raptors Sixers 4-5 will be what comes into play. They don't have the tiebreaker right now against the Bucs, and the Bucs have a pretty easy schedule to close. So do the Sixers. They play the Raptors, the Pacers, and the Pistons. But I wouldn't be stunned if all of these teams – win the majority of their games to close the year just because they are fighting for that positioning and so yeah in the form of the when it comes to the celtics they took a game up on the sixers last night as well at least they they got an extra win on them so they're a half game ahead of the sixers a raptors win over the sixers tonight puts them a game back with just two games to play that is pretty tough to, to make up there's not, not a lot of time here if those other teams are going to win ahead of the sixers they will need some help to get out of that four seed and so uh yeah this is a big one if the raptors really want that sixers matchup this should be one where they kind of go full bore and then rest themselves up in the final two games of the season a win tonight will also put them pretty comfortably in to that uh fifth seed as well they would have to lose out the bulls would have to win out if the raptors win tonight uh in order to get the uh for the raptors to fall back down of course the bulls have the tiebreaker but they'll have two games of distance between them and chicago if they win tonight so a surprisingly big one even though the playoff spots locked up We'll have it broken down in tomorrow's episode of the podcast with Yasmin Dewala from Yahoo Sports and Dishes and Dimes and Basketball News and all over the place because Yasmin is a freaking superstar. So yeah, that's a look forward to in the morning. Enjoy the game tonight. Should be a lot of fun. A big thanks as always uh, to you for listening and a huge thank you to Keith and Devon from Locked On Sixers, Kane from Locked On Bucks, and John from Locked On Celtics. Go check out those shows as the season or the postseason draws near and you want to get a read on those teams. If the Raptors are playing one of those teams, we'll do a crossover episode with one of them next week for sure. And I still recommend you go and listen to all of their shows as the postseason gears up if you're trying to get the intel on those teams. So uh, with that, thank you very much for making us your first listen of the day. Go, day, go make your second listen of the day locked in NBA, as I promised, uh, as I told you earlier. They're excellent, and they're covering all the games across the league every single night. They will have tomorrow morning some Raptors, excuse me, Raptors Sixers takes for you, no doubt. And uh, yeah, with that, we will talk to you again on Friday with another episode of Locked on Raptors. Bye-bye.